Um, I'm going to, um, we have Jennifer Miller. She doesn't really need an introduction here, but um, if you want to come and she's going to bring the word today. So I'm going to come and I'll pray. <laughs> I'm going to pray real quick for you. Um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for today and for your presence here. Thank you for meeting us. Lord, you always come and we just love you for that and we love your presence. We just ask that you open hearts today, Lord, and open open minds and ears so that we can hear the word. Lord, I pray for Jennifer that you just give her the words to speak that are your words out of her mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, in the earlier service, uh, I, I did the opening prayer, and I told him I was really tempted to use that prayer to, to set up and uh, introduce the sermon, but I, I just couldn't do it because... Uh, I take prayer so seriously, you know, that yes, I'm talking to my Heavenly Father, but I'm also talking to my God, my King, my Lord, right? And, uh, and what I mean by that is when I was thinking about what am I going to preach on, because by the way, on Tuesday, Jim changed my sermon plans. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, Jim. Uh, no, but I was praying into it, and, uh, and what kept coming to mind was I once taught a class on prayer. And um, to kind of introduce it, I had asked somebody to put together a montage of movie clips of scenes in which people pray. You know, and if you think about that, there's some, you know, it's actually very rare you get good prayers in movies. You know, normally there's something kind of crazy about it. Like, I don't know about you, but like, meet the parents, that prayer comes to mind, right? Day by day by day, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, and then for those of you who are familiar with the movie Joe versus the Volcano, see that one's actually good where he's like standing in awe at the moon, right? And he prays like, so there's some good ones, but the one that inspired this sermon, believe it or not, comes from Talladega Nights, <laughs> right? Ricky Bobby praying over this wonderful bounty of KFC and the ever delicious Taco Bell, right? But who's he praying to? He's praying to baby Jesus, Right? Little infant Jesus, little eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus, right? And his wife tells him, you need to stop that. This is uncomfortable. This is just not right. You know, his father-in-law, you know, he grew up. He became a man. He had a beard. Like, this is weird, right? And Ricky Bobby's justification is, Christmas Jesus is my favorite Jesus, right? That's my, that's my favorite Jesus. You can pray to whatever Jesus you want to pray to, right? And they actually start a discussion at the dinner table. Well, who's your favorite Jesus, you know? And I was thinking on that, and I'm like, who's my favorite Jesus? My favorite Jesus is instigator Jesus. It's stir the pot Jesus. It's ruffle feathers Jesus, right? That's my favorite. And I'm sure when I put that out there, some, some parts of the Gospels come forward, right? Like Jesus going and overthrowing the tables, you know, in the temple courts, right? That's instigator Jesus. Or what about that time that he went up to the Pharisees and he called them a brood of vipers or whitewashed tombs? He said that to their faces. Like, right, stir the pot, right? Or what about that one time he said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring what? A sword, right? Okay. But my favorite is that one time that he told a crowd of people, I'm the bread of life. Now, that may not make sense, right? But that's actually one of my favorite times that instigator Jesus showed up. And so if you want to follow along, we're going to, I'm going to actually read you some of that story. It's going to be in John 6. But let me set it up first so that you can understand what I mean. Why is this instigator Jesus? The day before is when he feeds the 5,000. Okay? So you kind of picture that, right? But that, that scene, though, that's hippie Jesus, right? He's there with the sandals, and like he's doing the bread and the fish, you know, and, right? And it says 5,000 men, but then you got to add women and children, and he probably fed, what, 15,000 people? I mean, there's a lot of people there, right? And, uh, and so that was the day before, okay? That night is when he walks on the water. Like they cross the sea, right? And he walks on the water, Okay. So the story I'm going to tell you is, is when, the next day, because that crowd tracked him down. They, they followed him. They went, where, where did he go? He went across the way. All right, we're going to go find him, right? And they track him down. But he knows why they're there. They're not actually seeking him. They're looking for more bread, right? Verse 26 
Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. You guys walked away yesterday with full bellies, and you're here looking for more bread. Now, I don't blame him, because if we think about the story where he turned water into wine, it said that that was like the best wine, right? So I could only imagine what that bread tasted like, right? That's probably really good bread, right? And they're like, hey, he just handed it out yesterday, and we had our fill. So we're going to go track him down. Let's get some more bread, right? And that's what he's calling him out, because he's saying, hold up, you're missing the point. The miracle was supposed to draw you in. It was supposed to bring you to me. It was supposed to inspire you to want to know me, not to show up with your hands out the next day asking for more bread, right? And that's what he calls him out for. He said, you guys are looking for the wrong kind of bread. You need to be looking for the bread of heaven. You need to be looking for the bread that sustains you into eternity, not just for a day. And of course, they listen to that and they're like, that sounds really good. Where do we get that bread? Right? And what does Jesus say? He goes, you got to believe in the one whom God sent, right? You got to believe in the one who's bringing the bread, okay? But they don't get it. Verse 30, they said to him, well, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? They were there yesterday, they already got the sign. They had five little loaves of fish, or loaves and two fish. They already got the miracle, and here they are going, "Well, what are you going to do today? What 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 trick are you going to perform? What miracle are you going to perform?" Right? And you know what this makes me think of? Back in ancient Rome, they called it bread and circus. That's how they kept the masses numb, right? They gave him bread and circus, and that's what this crowd is looking for. We're looking for bread and circus. Our culture today is kind of addicted to bread and circus. And we're missing the truth, right? We're missing, they're standing right there with Jesus and they're missing it, going, oh, what do you got for me today? What trick are you gonna do today, right? And so Jesus says, and so then they bring up manna. Let me point that out too. They go, well, you know, like our forefathers, they got manna like every day. So that's kind of their justification, right? So here's what Jesus says to them. Verse 32, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. Right? He's saying you guys are getting it wrong. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's saying, you, you, you misunderstood. That manna was never the bread from heaven. That manna and the bread I gave you yesterday was physical bread to sustain you here, but I'm offering you the bread that gives you eternal life. Okay? And so he's telling them what's the truth, right? He's saying, listen, you guys are focused on the wrong bread. Okay? And so once again, they're like, Jesus, that sounds really good. Where do we get that bread? Give us that bread. We want that bread, right? And so they're still missing it. So just, Jesus decides, okay, I'm going to, let's just be a little bit more direct, a little bit more clear. They're not quite getting it. So verse 35, Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So he's saying, it's me. I'm it. I'm the bread of life. Okay, so this whole bread that you keep asking for, you're missing it. Let me just be plain. It's me. I, I'm it, right? Now, what's interesting is Jesus talks for a few more verses, but it says that they didn't hear any of that because as soon as Jesus said, I'm it, I'm the bread of life, he lost them. That triggered him. That was like, what's he talking about? And they're sitting there murmuring and muttering and complaining and grumbling. And what's he talking about? How dare he say he's the bread of life? right? This is also the point where they're like, and isn't this Jesus, Joseph's kid? What's he talking about? We know him, right? And he knows it. He knows he's lost him. And he even tells him, you guys need to cut that out, right? You need to knock it off. You're murmuring. You're missing it, okay? So let me try and, and just 
tell you again, since you missed the whole thing I just said, because you're over here talking amongst yourself, let me say it again. Verse 47, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Again, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate men in the wilderness, and guess what? They died. Wrong bread, right? This is the bread which comes down from heaven. The one, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Hey, okay? He's like, let me just be as plain as I can be what we're talking about, because you guys are still fixated on manna. Wrong bread. I'm the bread of life. This is what I'm offering you because he's about to give himself up for us, right? His flesh is about to be the bread of the new covenant. His blood is about to be the blood of the new covenant. And this is what he's trying to clue him in on. Believe me, follow me, right? Trust me, I'm the living bread. And once again, they get hung up on the wrong thing. And they start talking, going, did he just say what I think he said? Did he just say we had to eat his flesh? Did, did I miss that part? Is that really what he said? So they're missing the whole point, focusing on one part. And so what I think is funny is in verse 53, Jesus says, yep, I said it. What you think I just said? Yes, I did. I just said it. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So they're, they're like, wait a second. Did he just say what I think he said? And Jesus goes, not only goes to say yes, he ups the ante. He says, yes, you do. You need to eat my flesh. But guess what? You also got to drink my blood. Now, if we're just, put yourself in the shoes of this crowd, right? They just came for another lunch, right? And all of a sudden, Jesus is like talking about cannibalism. You know, it is, it's a bit much, right? But this is why I said, this is instigator Jesus in, on full display. Now, on this side of the story, we know what he's talking about, right? We know every time we participate in communion, we are eating his flesh, we are drinking his blood, but we know what he's talking about. But on, you, I, I have some pity for the crowd, right? They were like, you know, this is kind of creepy, right? I mean, what would we do, right? If one Sunday Jim, Jim comes in and says, all right, y'all, I got the secret to eternal life, right? And you got to eat my body and you got to drink my blood. We got to go into cannibalism, y'all. Like that's, that's the new secret to eternal life we'd all be running for the door too, right? So I, I do understand why they were freaked out, but I also understood why Jesus went there because he didn't start there. He didn't start that boldly, that bluntly, right? He started out pretty gentle. He started out saying, okay, I, I know. I know what you came for. You came for another lunch. You came for physical bread, but let me tell you, I got something better for you. I have the bread of life. I have bread from heaven. I have bread that my father sent you, right? And they're just not getting it. And so he's like, okay, let me speak more plainly. That's me. I'm talking about me. You got to believe in me. You got to follow me, right? Be with me. And they're still not getting it. And they keep focusing on the wrong things until finally he's like, yes, yep, I'm going to speak that plainly, that boldly. You have to be that committed. You have to be that dedicated because guess what? At some point, all my people will be eating of my flesh and drinking of my blood because that's the flesh and the blood of the new covenant, right? So I get why they freaked out. But at the same time, Jesus didn't start there. He was an instigator, but he didn't start out there. And I think there's a lesson for us in that because we're supposed to be like Jesus. So what can we take away from how he approached this. And what I think it is, is he was demonstrating, he was embodying truth in love, right? He was speaking truth in love. 
But sometimes the most loving thing to do is to speak an uncomfortable truth. Sometimes the most loving thing to do is to speak of a harsh reality. It makes me think of what Paul wrote in Romans when he said the kindness and severity of God. Yes, there is a kindness, but there's also a pretty severe reality as well. Yes, he is loving and he is kind and he is merciful, but he's also just. He is also truthful. And that's what we're seeing here. Yes, it was a harsh truth, but it was the most loving thing he could do because they weren't getting it. They were focusing on the wrong things. So I'm going to give you three practical takeaways. And the first one is to emulate the process Jesus demonstrated. Now, some of you might come up with a better phrasing than I can. Uh, apparently, I'm not that clever because the only thing I can think to call it is this three-step-up approach. Okay? It's a three-step-up approach. So the first step, when we need to speak a truth, when we need to set a boundary, right? Because Jesus was setting a boundary here because these people had really bad boundaries. I mean, you know, we're over here one day and he's feeding them till they're full and they had all these baskets left over, right? And then he goes and walks across the lake and then he's over here. They go and they track him down demanding more. They, they really had poor boundaries, okay? So he's having to set a boundary. He's having to, to, to put a line in the sand. He's having to speak a truth. And sometimes we have to do that too. And it's not easy. It's uncomfortable, Right? And so the first step in that three-step process is to speak it gently, speak it lovingly, speak it kind, right? It's, I always say, you know, you, you include the, the pleases and the thank yous and the, the, the uh, I appreciate it, right? So if you're having to set a boundary, it's like, you know, that's just not going to work out. And, and I really appreciate what you're saying. I'm sorry if this causes you trouble and, or, you know, if this is a problem, but I just, you know, that's just not going to work out this time, right? But then you have that bulldozer that just like steamrolls right over it, right? Or just misses what you're saying. You're like, okay, I guess I got to be a little bit more clear. So that's the second step. So the second step is do what Jesus did, get a little bit more direct, right? So then you, you drop off some of the pleases and thank yous. And you just, you kind of strip away some of the, the, the niceness of it and get a little bit more direct. And you say, okay, well, like I said, you know, it's just not going to work out this time. So I'm just not able to do it. And, and again, I'm sorry if that, that creates a problem for you, but I'm just not able to do it this time. But then here comes that steamroller, right? And they roll right over that. Well, then we got to go to the third step. We speak plainly. We speak, speak bluntly, right? And this is where we say, look, I already said it twice, Right? but it's a no. It's a no. I'm not doing that this time. And you just speak it, right? But here's the thing is nowhere does it indicate that Jesus lost his temper or that Jesus got annoyed, right? That even when he's speaking plainly, he's still being loving. And so the way that I remember this last step is say what you mean, just don't say it mean. Say what you mean, just don't say it mean, okay? So sometimes, you know, so think about that. The next time you have to speak an uncomfortable truth, set a boundary, tell somebody no where it's not easy to say no, right? That we can emulate Jesus in this moment. That we can risk offending somebody. We can risk saying something they don't like hearing. We can risk telling them no, when they're really not going to be happy hearing that no, right? Um, but we need to still be loving and kind and patient like Jesus was. Because while he was an instigator, he was those other things too. He's not just an instigator, right? Even when he was overthrowing the tables in the temple courts, right? It actually says that he braided the whip that he used, so that means that he didn't just go in there brashly, uncontrolled, full of anger, right? No, he sat there and watched and braided a whip. Now, if we're talking about how good of wine Jesus made and probably how good of bread he made, just imagine Jesus coming at you with the whip he made, right? <laughs> okay, but he was still demonstrating self-control. And that was also still loving, 
Okay? So he, even when we think about all these times he was an instigator, he wasn't just an instigator. It was always tempered with kindness and love, patience, right? But there's another component I want to add to this because what I don't want is everybody running out going, well, Jennifer said that <laughs> I can start being blunt with everybody. Um, no, because again, you know, we're looking at one story. We need to look at the fullness of how Jesus, um, you know, treated people, how he approached situations. And there actually is another story in the Bible where Jesus encountered somebody who was looking for just a trick, for a miracle, for come and entertain me, right? They had impure motives. They were just wanting Jesus to come and, you know, I say like, you know, be that little circus monkey where it's like, come, come do the tricks, right? Okay. And I'm talking about Herod during the trials of Jesus. So if you're following with me, we're going to go over to Luke 23, because in Luke's account, we get a little bit more detail about what actually transpired between Jesus and and Herod. So we know the trials, right? It started with the Sanhedrin, then they took him over to Pilate, and he, you know, and then, and then Pilate realized, oh, you're from Galilee. Well, guess what? Herod's in town. So I'm going to send you over there, right? Trying to kind of pass on <laughs> the responsibility. So Jesus is brought to Herod. So we're going to be in verse 8. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, so he was excited, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him, and he had hoped to see some miracle done by him. Right there, right? Herod was not excited to meet Jesus because he heard he was a great teacher. He wasn't excited to meet Jesus because, you know, the, the, the kindness and the type of person he was. It's like, oh no, I heard that he can do some pretty miraculous things. And Herod was excited to see him because he wanted a trick. He wanted the miracle. Verse 9, let's see what Jesus did. Then he questioned him with many words, but Jesus answered him nothing. Jesus was silent. Right? In the midst of Herod, knowing what Herod wanted, knowing his intentions, knowing his desires, Jesus was silent. And the silence alone was enough to offend and to instigate and to stir up, because look at what they did to him. The chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, right there, just think about who's surrounding Jesus, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. Right? So Jesus is there enduring this mistreatment. He knew what Herod wanted. He knew the hearts of the men that were there, and he was silent. And I don't know if you've heard, I've heard that mentioned in songs and things, right? That like a lamb being led to the slaughter, he was silent, okay? But here's the interesting thing. He was only silent with Herod. He was not silent when he was with Pilate. So I'm going to read from John 18, because again, that's the account that gives us more detail about what actually happened between Jesus and Pilate. But I want us to look at the difference, because it's like, okay, well, hold up. Why is Jesus silent with Herod, but he's talking with Pilate? Because, first of all, I thought that he was quiet the whole time. No, he wasn't. He talked to Pilate. So verse 33, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I shall bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews, and he says, I find no fault in him. Here's the difference. Pilate wanted to know the truth. 
right? He's, he's has, you know, the chief scribes, the priests, all of them come in and they're delivering up Jesus, wanting him executed. And Pilate's like, what did you do? Right? What is going on here that they're coming and asking for your execution? He wanted to know the truth. And Jesus even basically said, now are you asking? Or is this actually coming from somewhere else? No, Pilate wanted to know. Who are you? What have you done? What is going on here? And Jesus speaks truth to him. And as I prayed into that, I'm like, okay, so Pilate wanted to know truth, and Jesus spoke to him. Herod wanted a magic trick, and Jesus was quiet. I think that's why he spoke to one and didn't speak to the other. And that's going to be your practical takeaway number two. When do we engage? When do we speak? And it's the question of, are you talking to a Herod or are you talking to a Pilate? Who are you talking to? Right? Because Herods, they're, they're not listening to actually know the truth, right? They got impure motives. They have selfish motives, right? Because while Jesus demonstrates speaking the truth in love, he's also demonstrating not casting your pearls before swine, lest they turn and trample you, right? Because Herod was going to turn and trample him. The scribes and the Pharisees that were there were going to turn and trample him. So Jesus is sitting here going, is this even a time and a place to try to cast pearls, Right? So that's one of the questions we need to ask. Lord, is this a Herod? Would I be casting pearls before swine? Would I be setting myself up for trouble that I otherwise don't need to be getting into? Is this someone who's receptive? Is this someone who's seeking truth? Is this someone that when, you, when Jesus looks into their heart, he says, yes, they're able to be changed. Yes, they're able to be wooed into a relationship with Jesus. Or, right, with Pilate, yes, that's what we're looking for. Somebody who's seeking truth. Herod, not so much. Are we speaking to a Herod or are we speaking to a Pilate? And so that is your second takeaway. Because when we're looking at the situation with Herod, Jesus' silence, he was still an instigator because his silence alone was instigating, but he was also still loving in that moment. Because think about the abuse he endured. Think about what they said to him, what they did to him. Think about the mistreatment, right? And he didn't have to take that. He is God, right? He didn't have to take that, right? He could have, oh, imagine how big those pearls would have been that Jesus could have thrown at them, right? Those truth bombs that would have laid them out flat, right? He could have, he could have pulled what he did to Job, in Job 38, right, where Job comes and he's accusing and he's demanding God answer him. And what does God do? Hold up. Let me ask you a question first. Where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? Do you even know its measurements? Do you know what it's anchored to? And where were you when I told the ocean to come this far and no further? And where were you when I hung the sun and the stars and the moon and the sky? Where were you when I did all these things? Right? He goes on for two chapters. And when I read that, I could just imagine Job just getting smaller and smaller, right? Until finally he's just like, never mind, sorry. Okay? He could have done that, right? He could have been like, you know what, you guys? Let me lay it out for you. Let me tell you who I am. Let me give you a bit of truth, right? He could have done that. And he didn't. Because he loves you more. Because he loves you more. Because he knew he had to endure that in order to die in your place. In order to be that bread of life for all of us. In order that we can come to his table and partake of his body and partake of his blood in remembrance of everything he did for us. So yes, he was an instigator, but even in that moment, he was loving. He chose you instead of casting pearls at swine. So when we're looking at situations, Lord, do I, do I step into this? Do I endure that abuse? We've got to be led, right? Because in this instance, Jesus didn't speak. He endured the abuse on your behalf. 
So when it's appropriate, don't be afraid to speak harsh truth. Just don't speak it harshly. Be kind, be patient, be loving, but it's also okay to be blunt when necessary. So that's that three-step up process. How do we know when it's appropriate to engage and when it's better to sit back? Are you speaking to a Herod? Are you speaking to a pilot? Now, for those of you who are tracking with me, you might be where I'm at, where it's like, well, hold up. What about that crowd he talked to? Weren't they a bunch of Herods? So you're over here saying he didn't speak to Herod because Herod had impure motives, right? But didn't this crowd also have impure motives? Well, many of them did, right? Because it's a large crowd of people. So they had their spokesmen up here who are, you know, they're asking for bread. And, you know, and so, yes, we do. We know that, that there were some Herods there, but weren't there pilots there too, right? Because that's where we need discernment. That's where we need wisdom. And Jesus had it. If we go back to John 6, it says that Jesus knew ahead of time who was going to choose him and who wasn't. He knew their thoughts and their motives. He knew it, okay? And he risked offending people. He risked, and it says these were disciples, by the way. They weren't strangers. It wasn't the first time they'd heard him. They were disciples that walked away. And they didn't just walk away for the day. They quit following him completely. That's who he was risking offending. But it's, he knew their hearts. And he knew that they weren't all Herods. And so after he watches the crowd disperse, right, the ones who weren't going to follow him anymore walked away, he then turns to the 12. Verse 67, then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? What about you guys? You going to stay? Or are you going to walk away too? Right? And good old Peter, Simon Peter speaks up. And he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where would we go? Peter got it. He was listening that whole time. He got it. He's like, no, no, no. You're the bread of life. You have the words of life. Where else would we go? We can't get this bread anywhere else. And then Peter says, also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Where else would we go? Not only are you the bread of life, but we now recognize you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so what this shows you is that there were pilots there listening too. And that's why Jesus chose to engage, even though he was going to offend the Herods and they were going to leave and spread who knows what kind of rumors, right? Because the pilots that were there listening were worth it. Okay? And now I've heard people who, who engage in like debates and uh, public speakers and things like that. And a lot of them, the, one of the rules they say is don't focus on the one you're debating with. Because a lot of times the one you're debating, they're not going to be convinced, right? They're there to challenge everything you're saying. They're there to poke holes in your arguments. They're there. They've already had their minds made up. They are not there for truth. They're there to present their side. That's it, right? So then why? Why engage in debates if that's what that person's like? You do it for the audience. You do it for the ones who are listening. You don't do it for them. You do it for the one, the third person, the one who is going... Well, I would like to know the truth. I would like to know what's going on. I'd like to hear it. And so that's what was happening in this situation. In the other one, the room was full of Herods. That's all that was there. And so Jesus was quiet. And then in this other room was just Pilate. And so he spoke. But it's rare that we find ourselves in those situations. So instead, we need to use discernment. We need to use wisdom. And when we're in that moment going, okay, Holy Spirit... Is this a time I speak up? Because there's some Herods here. Right? I'll be casting some pearls before swine. Okay? And if the Holy Spirit leads you to and says, but there's some pilots there too. Right? There are people like Peter. Because in the book of Acts, it says that Peter was an uneducated, ordinary man. He was just a fisherman. And if Peter got it, that means others got it too. They didn't all walk away. Others got it too. And so if the Holy Spirit's prompting you saying, nope, speak up, 
I, I know you may offend people. I know you may have people reject you, walk away from you, but guess what? There is somebody there that will get it. There is somebody there who will recognize the truth. There is somebody there who will then choose me. So what I want to encourage you all, and this is your, your final takeaway, keep getting to know Jesus because we need all the facets of Jesus. He is multifaceted, and we need all of them. Okay? We need more than just Christmas Jesus or Easter Jesus or instigator Jesus because he isn't just one of those things. He is all those things, and we need every piece and every part. And so if you don't know the fullness of Jesus, that's your third takeaway. Get into one of the Gospels and just read it to get to know him, to come to understand him. I want to encourage all of you to come to embrace the fullness of who Jesus is. It's okay that we like certain things, right? That we, there's certain stories we like. There's certain moments that we like. Like I said, my favorite is Instigator Jesus. But I don't just fixate on instigator Jesus. Don't limit yourself to just one piece, one part, one story. Because we have access to all of him. We have access to the fullness of him. So don't limit yourself. Get to know him. Because he's amazing. He is amazing. And he is the depth of him. We could live 10 lifetimes and not get to fully know and understand the depth of him. And if you think about it, each of us were drawn in by something different. We were not all wooed in by the same thing, but we do all have access to the fullness of him. So get to know him, embrace him, follow him. Don't walk away like that crowd did. Let's pray. If you want to all stand, the prayer team can come up. So. All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for just your revelation, for your word, for your insights, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being loving and kind and merciful, Lord, but also challenging us, stretching us, growing us, Lord. Thank you for just giving us access to the fullness of you. And Lord, I just pray that each of us expose, reveal, show us where we can know you more, where we can go deeper into that understanding, where we can just embrace more of you. We can embody more of you. We can just follow you that much better, that much more closely. And so, Lord, I just pray for the team that is in Cuba right now. I pray for those who are going this week. Lord, that you just bless them and establish them and uh, open the doors, prepare the hearts and minds, Lord, for the word, for the ministry, for whatever revelation it is that you have for the Cuban people and however you're going to use our family members as vessels there, Lord, that you just establish them and bless them, but also protect them and bring them home safely too. And Lord, I just want to bless everybody here that as we go out into this week, Lord, that you just continue to show us when are those moments, Lord, that we speak up, when are those moments we should be quiet. And Lord, when you prompt us to speak up, to guide us, to help us, to put the words in our mouth, Lord, that we can emulate you and we can still be kind and loving. And Lord, I just want to bless everybody. And I just thank you for this wonderful church family that we all get to be a part of. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So anybody who needs prayer for any reason, please come forward. But I especially want to encourage those that don't know Jesus. Or maybe you only know one part of him and you want to grow deeper. I encourage you to come and get prayer as well. Thank you.